all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. I can't wait to see that day when the name of Jesus Christ is glorified and acknowledged by all people, heaven and in earth, and even under the earth. Paul the Apostle says, we do not yet see all things put under Christ's subjection, but we do see Jesus Christ crowned with glory and with honor. And the day will come when every eye shall behold him. We all will see him as he truly is. What a wonderful, wonderful worship session that was this morning. We continue our study in the book of Exodus chapter 4. And now that the preliminaries have concluded, this negotiation between God and Moses has come to an end. God has finally been able to convince Moses to trust him. The time has come for Moses to return to Egypt, to go back home, to revisit his past. Because Moses has some unfinished business in Egypt. Since he was a young man, he had the sense that he was born to free his people from their bondage. But in the past, he went about it in the wrong way. He was fighting against the ungodly system of slavery, and he was fighting in his own strength. And his strength was proven insufficient for the task at hand. And when we are young in the faith and full of vigor and vitality, we think that we can change the world through argumentation or demonstration or by force or by our example. And it doesn't take long before we realize that we are not up to the task. That our ambition to set our neighbor free is snuffed out once we recognize that our neighbor has free will. And they get to choose the way that they should go. And no amount of human force, nor might, nor power can change the human heart. But God can change hearts and minds by the power of his spirit. So when Moses returned to his father-in-law, Jethro, he said to him, please let me go, that I may return to my brothers who are in Egypt and see if they are still alive. Please let me go. Sounds familiar. These are the same words Moses is instructed to say to Pharaoh in chapter 3, verse 18. Please let us go. It's a request, not a demand. And this is the same request Moses makes to his father-in-law, Jethro. Please let me go. Because before you can free someone else, you must first be free yourself. Free from corruptions and free from self-ambition. Free from self-righteousness. Not free from your father-in-law, but definitely free from the law of sin and the law of death. Before you can free someone else, you yourself must first be free. And there is nothing more counterproductive in the work of the Lord than a person who does not practice what they preach. Someone who specializes in uncovering the splinter in their brother's eye while neglecting the plank in their own eyes. Please let me go. I have come of age. Moses has grown to the point where he is able now to bear the burden of others because he has cast his cares upon the Lord. He is quitting his job to go do the Lord's work. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. How difficult must this have been for Jethro to let Moses go? It's been 40 years. These two men have been working side by side, building up the enterprise. And now Jethro is an old man. He has no doubt come to depend on Moses. And even Jethro's daughters have become old. He had to be wondering who's going to guard the flocks that night. Who has the stamina to lead the sheep to the backside of the desert and camp all night beneath the stars? Who's going to take Moses' place? Moses' request to leave has to hurt his heart. But Jethro is a priest of God. He knows the sacrifices that come with obeying God's will. So he does not protest. He does not remind Moses of how good he's been to him. Instead, he gives Moses this parting instruction, go in peace. While this was a common phrase of farewell, you cannot help but sense the pastoral tone that Jethro conveys. You see, Jethro has been watching Moses for 40 years, and Jethro has always known that something was bothering him. There was an uneasiness about Moses that only a pastor's eye could detect. Something has been burning in Moses' heart for all these years. And it was his concern for his people. That same concern that caused him to flee from Egypt and land on this pastor's doorstep. And Jethro had to know from the beginning that Moses was made for something greater, something more than following sheep across the desert. And now the time has come for Moses to take his place in his heavenly father's business. Moses and God 
have always been on the same page as it relates to the Hebrews. Both God and Moses wanted to see the people set free. But while Moses and God shared the same objective, Moses' and God's strategies were far apart. And it took 40 years of wandering in the desert for Moses to be healed of his violent temper. Moses wanted to overthrow the Egyptians by human force. But those who would live by the sword will die by the sword. It is not by the swords of men that God will have his way, but by the sword of the Spirit. So Moses, you can go, but go in peace, not in war. Now the Lord said to Moses, Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who were seeking your life. All of them are dead. And guess what, Moses? You didn't even have to kill them. You didn't even have to lift a finger, Moses. All you had to do was wait a while. And this is a very practical observation I make this morning, that some problems die of simple neglect. That I don't have to fight every single battle, but some of the obstacles that are in my way will dissipate if I would simply stop giving them life. In James chapter 4, verse 7, we are admonished to resist the devil and he will flee from you. Evade the devil, avoid the devil, ignore that devil, and he will walk away from you. Stop answering his questions, stop entertaining his accusations, stop feeding into his false narratives about you and about your life. Stop fearing his power, stop trembling when he roars, stop acknowledging his actions, and the devil will get bored, and the threat will diminish. And you didn't even have to lift a finger. While you've been walking around in the desert, Moses, while you've been building your new life, studying at the feet of Jethro, all the men who were seeking your life have died off. And you remain haunted by the past, but the past is forever gone. And what you are fearing is not this present reality, but the shadows of enemies long since defeated. All of your enemies are dead. How many of you are still wrestling and fighting with things in the past. Very often, brothers and sisters, we make our own demons. We create our own adversaries in our own minds and we worship our own problems to the point where they take on a life of their own and produce within us worries that are not based on anything real, only imagined. Most anxiety and much of our depression is the result of demons that we create, phantoms that we construct, illusions that are bonded to and empowered by our own mental energies. I wonder how many times has Moses run from a passing caravan? How many times has Moses hidden himself in the clefts of the rocks, afraid of passers-by? That might be the Egyptians. They might have a warrant for my arrest running from an invisible enemy that no longer even exists, afraid of his own shadow. Your enemies are dead. They can harm you no more. Go back to Egypt. And so Moses took his wife and his sons and mounted them on a donkey and returned to the land of Egypt. Moses also took the staff of God in his hand. He left Midian, and he left Midian with nothing but his family, a donkey, and a stick. This doesn't sound like a man preparing to go up against the most powerful man in the world. This looks like a shepherd. It reminds me of Jesus when he sent his disciples out to heal the sick in Luke chapter 9. He told his disciples, take nothing for the journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. I know I'm sending you to heal the sick, but take no stethoscope, take no thermometer, take no scalpel, take no surgical gown. But you will heal the sick by the word of faith alone. By the standards of men, those disciples were not qualified to heal anybody. They didn't have the proper degrees. They didn't have the proper experience or equipment that a doctor should have. But they were sent to heal the sick. And if God sends you, God will equip you to, equip you to accomplish his purpose. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Now, this is where things get a little complicated. God has equipped Moses. God has empowered Moses with all these special miracles and abilities. But God does not plan to use those powers to set his people free. The power that Moses is going to present before the Pharaoh 
will serve only as a testimony against Pharaoh. And God brings judgment because that decision was already made long before God called Moses from the bush. This Pharaoh's fate was already sealed and God was not willing to give him any space to repent or to change his mind. God had decided that Egypt's sins against the Hebrews will not be forgiven, and that his justice will not be remedial but punitive in nature. He says, I'm going to cause Pharaoh to be overcome by a spirit of stubbornness so that he will not let the people go, so that God may be justified when he exacts his vengeance. Moses is going in peace, but God is coming for war. And the meeker Moses appears, the more assertive God will be in him. And the humbler Moses appears, the more overbearing God will be in him. And the less Moses takes his mission personally, the more his mission will be dominated by God. And that is exactly what we want. For God to have his way in us and through us without the need on our part to shoulder the weight of responsibility. Because the fact of the matter is, no matter how compassionate Moses feels toward the Hebrews, no matter how empathetic Moses may feel toward the Hebrews, the liberation of the Hebrews is God's responsibility, not Moses'. The advancement of the kingdom of God in this world is Christ's responsibility, not yours and not mine. Therefore, we do not fight and we do not strive and we always come in peace. No weapons in our hands, no anger in our hearts. And yet behind our humble facade stands the lion of the tribe of Judah, and it is he who is doing his work through us. After 40 years of wandering in the desert, Moses has finally come to the end of himself and of his own strength, and now he is ready for the master's use. All Moses needs is faith and the willingness to be available, and God will do the rest. Then God says, once I have hardened Pharaoh's heart, once I have caused him to be unwilling to let the Hebrews go, this is what I want you to say to Pharaoh. This is what the Lord says. Israel is my son, my firstborn. Interestingly enough, God chose not to reveal this intimate detail to Pharaoh at first. Pharaoh has no idea whom he has taken captive. Pharaoh has no idea who these people are related to. But that's not God's fault. That's Pharaoh's fault. Because had he taken the time to trace the history of Egypt's interactions with the Hebrews, Pharaoh would have learned from his forebears that the Hebrews were a special people. Had he taken the time to look back in the Egyptian archives, he would have learned the history from Genesis chapter 12, where that Pharaoh abducted Sarai, Abraham's wife. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 17 says that the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and on his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. Had he just taken the time to do his homework, he would have known who these people were and he would have let them go. And now God has to tell him, Israel is my son. Israel is my family, my blood. And not only is Israel my son, he is my first born son. He is my junior. To touch him is like touching the pupil of my eye. It is offensive. It is painful. Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, let my son go so that he may serve me. But you have refused to let him go. Behold, I am going to kill you. I am going to kill your son, your firstborn. Wow. Modern biblical scholars refuse to believe that God would ever do such a thing as this. In contemporary Christian literary circles, the God of the Old Testament was just misunderstood and his actions were misinterpreted by his father. God would never do this. God would never even threaten to do something like this because God is love. Yes, God is love. And while God loves the whole world, God has a special love for those who are called by his own name and God is protective of his sons and of his daughters. God loved them so much that he was willing to kill so that they might be free. That sounds so violent, doesn't it? It makes God seem so volatile and prone to emotional outbursts. God is so mad he's just gonna start killing people. But this is not some spontaneous outburst. This is God acting on behalf of his children. And any father whose son or daughter was being abused and held hostage against their will, any father 
would feel and try to do the exact same thing. Israel is my son. This is personal. Joe is my son. This is personal. Ying is my daughter. This is personal. The father is tasked with defending his children by whatever means necessary. And it just so happens that God has every means at his disposal. God loves us so much, brothers and sisters, that he is willing to kill for us. But that is not the summit of the love of God. Because while God is willing to kill for us, God is also, and he has demonstrated that he is willing to die for us as well. He is willing to endure acts of violence against his own person for our sake. Because Jesus Christ died, because God in Christ endured those acts of violence against his person without retaliation, we now live. God's greatest act of violence is not what he's about to do to Egypt. God's greatest act of violence is what he did for us on Calvary's cross. The violence he perpetrated against his own self so that you and I could be free. Because contrary, contrary to our beliefs, love is the highest form of violence that the world has ever known. Let me say it again. Love is the highest form of violence the world has ever known. Love opposes and defeats every force. Love defeats every power in this world. Love frustrates its enemies. Love thwarts the plans of its detractors. Love burns down the whole world. And love makes all things new. Love is the greatest act of violence the world can ever know. And the love of the Father for his children is unrelenting. And because of this love of God, there is no cause for you or for me to fear. We are his children. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his children and we are the sheep of his pasture. And because of this, we are forever safe. And we can believe this today. We can have confidence in this today. That no weapon that has been formed against us can prosper. And every tongue that rises up against us in judgment, we shall condemn. Because this is the inheritance of the saints of God. And our righteousness comes from him. And God will defend his people. Yes, he will. God will defend his people. And there is no cause for fear, no cause for worry, because our God is with us. Let's pray. Father, great is your loving kindness toward us. How great is the love that you have for your children. We thank you today, Father God, for your willingness to condescend, to come down to our level, to take on flesh and bone and blood, to set your people free. Father, I pray for us today and for the many worries and concerns that keep us awake at night and trouble our hearts and our minds. I pray today, Father God, that you will redirect our thoughts and redirect our attitudes, redirect our vision toward the things that belong to you, that we might look to the hills from whence comes our help because we know that our help comes from you. Some of us are troubled today, despondent and disillusioned worried and afraid. I pray today that you give us the confidence to cast our cares upon you, trusting and believing that you care for us. Speak your word from your holy temple, Lord God, and let all of our enemies be scattered. The enemy of fear and the enemy of anxiety, the enemy of frustration and the enemy of unease. I pray for us today, Lord God, that just as you defended the Hebrews from the Egyptian slavery, that you would defend us against all things that might come against us in this world, that you would make our path straight, and that our enemies would be scattered so that we can serve you freely in spirit and in truth for your glory and in your name. Amen. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. In Jesus' name, you're dismissed.